Hi folks, we are going to begin talking today about the effect of temperature on reaction rate. And I want you to first begin to think back to the lizards at the beginning of chapter 13. And when temperatures get cold, they get lethargic. Can you hypothesize why? Um, I also encourage you to take a minute to look back at problems 12 and problem 13 and see what was said about temperature. Because temperature has not really been considered this chapter so far. Because so far, temperature, as in problem 12 and 13, has been a constant. And what's dependent on temperature is not concentration, but K. If you think about it, if you think about our rate law, rate equals K times the concentration of the reactants to some power, well, concentration can't be determined or be affected by temperature, and so K, the rate constant, is going to be dependent on temperature. And so going back to the lizards, they become lethargic when it gets cold because they have less energy. They're, um, they need energy, they need heat to get their processes moving. So generally what happens, and you can think about this in terms of a lot of processes, as temperature increases, rate increases, therefore K will increase because rate is directly related to K. Well, how do we relate K and temperature? We do it through this Arrhenius equation. The Arrhenius equation is K equals A, also known as the frequency factor, um, the logarithmic E to the negative E sub A, which is activation energy over R times T. A lot going on here for certain. Um, Something really, really important to start with, though, is this concept of activation energy. And activation energy is kind of explained here in terms of definition, but I think this picture really shows it the most. This is an energy um, reaction coordinate diagram, and you can see that we have energy on the left, reaction progress on the right. Here we have the reactants, and then in order to get to the products, there has to be this increase in energy. This is called the activation energy. The energy that's required to get a reaction started and it's from the energy of the reactants up to that higher hump, which is called, and you'll see below here, the activation energy. Or sorry, up at the top it's called the activated complex. So we have reactants. Here's another example of it. CH3NC becoming CH3CN, meaning the C and the N are flipping around. Well, it takes a certain amount of energy to get that to happen. And you can see what's actually happening here. To get that to take place, we actually have to kind of separate the C and the N um, in here so then that it can flip. This is called the activated con complex. Think about it. It's going to take energy to do that. And then the product is um, at the end of the reaction coordinate diagram. And you can see, um, again, that between the reactants and the activated complex is called the activation energy. It's the energy to get the reaction going. And then you can also calculate the delta H of the reaction. In this case, energy is released because the products end up lower in energy than the um, reactants were to begin with. So that top pump being that activated complex, just kind of going back over, letter C is going back over, things that we already talked about. Um, looking back up at the top at that equation, K is equal to the frequency factor A, the number of approaches to the activation barrier per unit time. Frequency meaning um, how frequently those um, particles are attempting to react, okay? Maybe they don't react every time, but um, how much do they react? And then the other part of this, besides the frequency factor, is this exponential factor, the other part of the equation, and it represents a fraction of molecules that have enough energy to make it over the barrier. 
meaning the fraction of molecules that have enough energy at a particular temperature. Um, a low activation energy and a high temperature is certainly going to make um, the exponential factor closer and closer to 1, um, which means that it has no impact. And then there are other times um, where it will have an impact. You can see this diagram is interesting. This is our activation energy um, for a particular reaction. And it's talking about the area under the curve, the, area, the shaded regions show areas under the curve where these particles have enough energy to react. And so you can look over here for a higher temperature, T2. The area under the curve where the number of collisions that occur will be greater um, that actually exceed the activation energy. All right, so this collision model is what's going to be really important soon. Let's go back to Arrhenius quickly and get some calculations under our belt before we get further into this collision model. So, taking a look here is our equation, um, but if you take the natural log of both sides of the equation, we get a lot more information. And due to the rules of logs, you can take two things that are being multiplied together and separate them with a plus sign. So we've done that. Then um, you can also, the natural log of E is going to be, um, those two things are going to cancel each other out. And so then we just get the exponent there, which was negative E sub A, activation energy over R times temperature. Um, and here is an equation of a line which is wonderful because we always want to try to use equations of lines when we can in order to predict phenomena. So, taking a look here, it says for problem 21, it says determine the frequency factor. Well, what's frequency factor? Looking back, that's A. We're trying to calculate A. And then what's the activation energy? Activation energy, again, is called E sub A for the following plot. So, here's the plot. The units for K, by the way, are 1 over molarity times seconds. I think that'll kind of play a role here. We definitely need to know that it's um, first order, actually, this reaction. And so um, if we look at our natural log of K versus 1 over T, so we've got Y, we've got M, we've got X, and then we've got B. And what we want to do is we want to first find the frequency factor. Well, the frequency factor is within the y-intercept. B is equal to the natural log of A. Well, I know the y-intercept is 26.8. It's given to me in that equation. And, that, um, and that's in units of 1 over molarity times seconds. And then I have the natural log of A. Well, then I want to get rid of the natural log. E to the cancels those out. E to the, well, this is going to end up really um, large number. So this exponential. And so then I get A being equal to 4.31 times 10 to the 11th power. The units are just the same molarity times seconds. Question also asks for activation energy. Well, activation energy is in the slope. So m is equal to the opposite of e sub a over r. And then what I have to do is I have to look at the slope, which is negative 1.14. Oops, 1.1. Two times 10 to the fourth power, um, and that is equal to the opposite of the activation energy over the R value dealing with energy, 8.314 um, joules per Kelvin times moles. And then, and you can think about over here, our units are um, in terms of the um, temperature as well because it was 1 over T. And so our activation energy we can end up solving for, we end up to be 
93,100 joules over moles. All right. Um, letter B says, then use the graph to predict the rate constant at 1,000 Kelvin. Well, we have to think about, well, what's 1,000 Kelvin on the graph? 1,000 Kelvin on the graph is 0 0.001, 1 over 1,000. And then I have to come up here and see what I think it is going to be for the natural log of K. And I know this is 15. This must be 17.5. This must be 20, and so I approximated it to be about 15.5. So, um, in this case, I can use the fact that the natural log of k is equal to 15.5, and then I just solve for k. e to the, e to the, and the rate constant this time would be 5 million 300 and 90,000, one over molarity and seconds. Um, letter C, predict the rate constant at 298 Kelvin. And it says, can you use the diagram this time? Well, no, because it's actually going to be higher than that. 298 Kelvin is pretty tough. It's going to be somewhere in this region, which is going to end up up there somewhere. And so I actually have to use the equation of the line where I'm going to say the natural log of k is equal to negative 1.12 times 10 to the fourth and then 1 over temperature which is 298 Kelvin plus the natural log of 26.8. The natural log of k would then be equal to negative 3.43, and you solve that, and then e to both sides, I end up with 1.27 times 10 to the negative 15th, 1 over molarity times seconds. Much, much smaller rate constant with a lower temperature. Um, let's look at another example here. Um, example 23 actually goes along with some information that we're going to look at on the next page. The equation that we need to do this is given on the next page. It's the natural log of K2 over K1 is equal to the activation energy over R times 1 over T1 minus 1 over T2. And what this does is it just kind of gives us two points to work with, kind of like that um, clausius clapeyron equation that we used previously as well. And so you can solve a problem like number 23 using this information. Um, why don't you take a minute to try to solve it, pause it, and then I will show you my work in just a few moments. All right, you can go ahead and look at the... Um, work that I showed here, notice I did convert my temperatures to Kelvin. That's very, very important. Problem 24, reaction A and reaction B have identical frequency factors, meaning A is constant. However, reaction B has a higher activation energy than reaction A. Which reaction has a greater rate constant at room temperature? Well. The thing we have to keep in mind here is that rate is directly related to K, and um, if reaction B has a higher activation energy, that means that though even though they have the identical number of um, collisions happening, frequency approaching activation energy, um, what's going to happen is that reaction A is going to have a higher rate. Therefore, it has more, what I would call, effective collisions because more of those collisions that happen are reaching the required activation energy, okay? So reaction A is going to be the one with the greater rate constant because rate will go up there. All right, problem 25 is really similar um, 
to the one that we just got finished with. So I'm going to leave that one for you to do on your own. Um, it's a first order reaction. You can see the rate constants that are there. Um, please take a little bit to complete that. Then let's go on to the collision model. Um, explaining the factors that influence whether a reaction is going to happen. And so the things that we need to keep in mind are that molecules must collide in order to react, but they must collide with enough energy and with the correct orientation. I cannot stress enough how important this section right here is in understanding it, okay? If molecules are going to react, they must collide. They must collide with enough energy, and they must collide in the correct orientation. And so if we get a little math going on here about activation energy, and here is, again, our original Arrhenius equation, and that A can be broken down into an orientation factor and a collision frequency. There's kind of two pieces that are happening there. Um, the orientation factor is going to be talked about below. The Z is the collision frequency, how frequently they collide. And so when we talk about this orientation, what do, I, what do you mean by the correct orientation? Well, I know your pictures are not colored, but hopefully you can still tell with the different sizes of the atoms. Um, but when these things collide, um, we can have ineffective collisions where we don't get two things next to each other that we want to form. We do not want to make two ends together at all. We want ends to be separate. We also don't want a red and a green. We don't want O and Cl to react. But what we do want to react, which would be an effective collision, would be the, the two chlorines reacting together to make Cl2. And so um, there are three possible collision orientations but only one of them would be effective, okay? And so the why there, be sure to put in that not all of these um, atoms do we want to react. And so for this reaction, the orientation factor is 0.16, or 16 out of 100 would have energetically sufficient collisions to form those products. Let's look at problem 16 then. Which reaction would you expect to have the smallest orientation factor? Remember, orientation factor, when you're thinking about smallest of them, remember that rate is directly related to K, and K is directly related to that orientation factor, an orientation factor being P, okay? So all those things are related, and we want to think about which one would have then the slowest rate. The reason being because it's going to be most difficult to get to collide. Well, if you take two atoms and combine them together in A, every time that you collide, they should be in the correct orientation. You've got 360 degrees and this whole sphere all around. And letter B, this one is a little more complicated with two diatomics, but still, um, I eventually want to get H and I to react, so that's probably going to go down a little bit from A, but definitely still pretty large. And then when I look at this HCl and HCl reacting, I want to make H2. If these collide with the way that they're shown, no reaction will happen, okay? They could collide also in ways that reactions do happen, but this one, letter C, is going to have the smallest orientation factor. All right, we'll chat more about this in class tomorrow. Um, thank you so much for taking the time tonight to watch this blank wall video.